Very good. Thank you for um, joining us. My name is Medea Benjamin with the Peace Group Code Pink, and we are very delighted to have our guest, uh, Negar Mortazavi, with us today. She is a very prominent Iranian American journalist, writes regularly for uh, The Independent and uh, BBC, and is on uh, uh, US television networks and uh, is very prolific and very brilliant. So we're very delighted to have you on, uh, Negar, with us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for the kind introduction. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us, for giving us the time today. So we have about a half hour with you. We want to make the best use of the time. And I thought perhaps we could start out with you giving us an update about what's actually happening in Iran. First, from the point of view of uh, this pandemic that has hit Iran so terribly, making it the uh, epicenter of COVID-19 in the Middle East. And can you tell us uh, how bad things are, how the healthcare system is dealing with this? Thank you. Sure, so as the health ministry has put out official numbers um, as of today, close to 100,000 Iranians, 95,000 to be exact, have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And uh, over 6,000 people have died in the country, across the country, in almost every province. Um, and it seems like the virus is still spreading in the country. Um, these are also, we have to remember, official numbers. And um, the actual, the real number is probably much higher because there is not enough testing being done and the healthcare system, the country's health system has been um, overwhelmed by the number of patients and the severity of this problem. Initially, um, this started um, like many of the other epicenters. It seems like it came from China. It's actually um, one of the reasons is because of the close ties, business, economic and political ties that Iran has with China specifically under the shadow of US tensions, China has been a lifeline uh, as far as business to Iran. That uh, was one of the reasons that this um, quickly spread, arrived in Iran and started to quickly spread um, in the country. Basically travel and ties with China wasn't cut um, very quickly. And then it started in the holy city of Qom. That was the initial epicenter in Iran um, with very powerful religious figures basically living in that holy city. So we saw a little bit of a clash between um, these powerful religious figures and uh, the government, basically the central government at some point. And um, from Qom, from the city of Qom, it spread to um, other places in the north by the Caspian Sea was one of the um, other areas where we saw severe um, numbers of patients and deaths of both the patients and health workers also and then Tehran and of course um, other provinces. There were some uh, measures by the government as far as lockdown, social distancing, a lot of messaging on educating the public but then at the same time again this goes back to the country's economy because of the um, economic problems that the government is dealing with. It seems like they don't have enough resources and also the authority um, to keep a close um, lockdown, basically, or a quarantine, um, let's say, compared to the measures that some Asian countries took or some in Europe are taking right now. So it seems like Iran is hit by a perhaps triple whammy. They have the sanctions uh, COVID-19, and on top of that, the plunging of the price of oil. So if you put all these things together, what does this mean for ordinary Iranians? Exactly. So I was just speaking to an economist who focuses on Iran. He was telling me that Iran is facing a 50% budget deficit. That's, that's a huge gap that the country is facing. And exactly as you said, it's a direct result of sanctions of the price of oil and also this um, COVID-19, the crisis that everyone else is facing. And this 50% budget deficit is basically the highest in the history of the country itself. So it means the government is, has to deal with basically the lack of billions of dollars in resources and 
it's just made it very difficult to basically when you tell people to sit home or to not work, you have to be able to feed them, to support them. And um, it, it's just, it's not a kind of resource, a financial resource that the country has right now. And then add to that also a lot of internal domestic layers of this corruption, this mismanagement of resources, all of that adds layers to this very complicated problem. But the three major um, economic factors have now um, basically put this country in, in a very tough situation. At the same time, I have to, um, being fair to the country's health system and health workers, it's actually one of the best health systems in the region. We have to remember they're very excellent doctors and health workers in Iran, not enough in numbers. So for example, there's a shortage of nurses. So they're very much overworked um, and dying in big numbers, but it's one of the best health system. But just the problem, the capacity of the system is not enough for this problem. It's beyond um, what the health system could have handled. Well, it seems like the Trump administration is saying hit them while they're down. Uh, and is looking for any way it can to uh, tighten the sanctions even further during, the, during this time, and even going to the lengths of stopping Iran from getting a $5 billion loan from the IMF that is uh, supposed to be available for uh, countries that need this uh, support to combat the COVID-19. So in what ways uh, do you see the U.S policy being particularly inhumane at this time. Exactly, like you're saying, it's incredible. First of all, talking about the IMF loan, this is the first time since the 1960s that Iran has requested this type of loan from the IMF, $5 billion in emergency funds, basically, uh, which Iran could access because of the severity of the problem. And the US, uh, the Trump administration basically um, despite many domestic and international calls, the administration has said that they're prepared to block the vote on IMF. Now, it's still not 100% clear if they're going to be able to or if this would go on. There's, it's still in a limbo situation, but that's the U.S. is a powerful force, a funder in the IMF, and um, they have great say in that. And as far as sanctions, exactly like you said, the administration has not um, eased much of the sanctions on Iran. In fact, they have announced new sanctions during the time of the COVID-19 crisis, despite massive calls, international and domestic calls. We've heard from progressives, we've heard from dem moderate Democrats at the U.S. Congress calling for uh, each for some sort of, you know, easing of sanctions or opening up more humanitarian trade and the international community, the Europeans, um, Asians, uh, UN Secretary General, UN's Human Rights High Commissioner, all of them have been calling on the Trump administration to ease sanctions, not just on Iran, but on other countries in this time of crisis um, so that they, the governments can have the resources or basically the capacity to deal with the problem. But we haven't seen much of that from the administration. And in fact, we hear from um, more hawkish groups in Washington basically pushing the administration to even um, tighten the sanctions and, um, like you said, hit Iran while, while they're dealing with this problem. So what is the international community doing other than uh, calling for the U.S. to ease these sanctions? Why has it been so difficult for the Europeans to get this financial mechanism in stacks that they were supposed to uh, get ready to be a, a way to barter with Iran and get around the sanctions? Uh, how have the Russians and the Chinese been doing? Are they able to continue uh, trade or have they also been affected by the U.S. sanctions? Well, almost all countries have been affected because, of course, the U.S. Is, has the biggest and the most powerful economy in the world and the sanctions regime is not only targeting Iran, but basically the secondary sanctions measures are going to target any other country, company, banks that do any kind of business with Iran. Iran still does some type of business with some of its neighbors. Iraq is one of the uh, biggest trade partners with Iran. Turkey, um, another one that do a lot of unconventional or more traditional methods when it comes to trade and payments because of this block that U.S. sanctions have put on 
um, most around banks and on doing any kind of transactions using U.S. dollars. China also um, is another trade partner, but it's just not something that's been enough for, for the Iranian economy, especially because the main commodity is oil and they need to be selling that oil to a lot more countries, including Europe. The Europeans haven't uh, been able basically to stand up to U.S. sanctions as much as they wanted to. In reality, we hear very strong political statements coming from Europeans, but when it comes to reality and the actual economic side of it, we don't see that as much happening. Now, Instex, like you said, the um, instrument, basically the channel that is set up by the Europeans, it took a long while for that to start, and there has been one transaction, so it's good news, but it's just not enough. It's not something that um, would be much helpful in this situation. And then I also want to mention some other humanitarian um, helps that some of Iran's neighbors and basically the international community jumped in to help under the shadow of U.S. sanctions. Iranians uh, were having some trouble um, getting test kits of corona at the beginning, and the World Health Organization basically stepped in with the help of the United Arab Emirates, actually one of Iran's foes in the region, who is also their neighbor and is impacted by this epicenter. Um, the World Health Organization provided some test kits, and then China, um, South Korea. So there have been um, international help, but it's just the severity of, of the problem, again, as I said, and the financial gap that the country is facing is beyond something that can be filled with aid and, you know, that kind of help, especially we have to remember that this is a time that the whole world is dealing with this crisis. It's not only Iran or a few other countries. Everyone is struggling to get equipment, medical equipment, medical supplies. But Iran is dealing with this extra layer of the problem, which is the sanctions and the economic um, deficiencies. So given how difficult the economic situation is and the manufactured crisis by the Trump administration uh, when they pulled out of the nuclear deal and uh, reimposed these sanctions, uh, we hear that the conservative factions within Iran have been strengthened by this. I think many people in the United States think of Iran as a monolith being run by a theocratic regime. What is the play internally inside Iran and what's the balance of forces at this moment? Well, Iran is definitely not a monolith, just as for example, here in the U.S. there are different factions. There's at least two major factions in Iran. The hardliners, who are the ones who are for more militaristic approach in the region for less trade and less political and diplomatic relations and engagement, at least with the West. And then we have the moderates or reformists, a combination of that camp, uh, which is supported by the majority of the population, by the way. Um, by the youth, by women, by the urban middle class. Those are the ones who are for more engagement, for diplomacy with the West, for more trade with Europe, even with the US. And we saw a result of that under the Iran deal, basically the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was a historic years of uh, negotiations between Iran and the US essentially in a very historic deal. Um, that was the result or the fruit of the moderate um, policies of, of the Iranian political structure. But then since President Trump pulled out of the deal and basically closed avenues or doors as far as engagement or diplomacy between Iran and the U.S., Iran and Washington, um, we see a more hardline approach, a more unified hardline voice coming out of Iran. We see the more hardline parts of the political structure, basically the IRGC, the SEPA, um, the let the, what ones those are. the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, basically it's a arm, it's a, Iran's major armed force that is also uh, that has a much a high stake in the Iranian economy, owns and operates a major part of the Iranian economy, and is also basically overseeing Iran's regional activities, the regional adventures that the U.S. is still opposed to. Since President Trump pulled out of the deal, basically his logic was that this is a bad deal. I'm going to pull out of it and I'm going to get a better deal that will rein in Iran's activities and, you know, limit the nuclear program, Iran's nuclear program, and um, it will just be better for everyone. 
but we haven't seen that deal happening. We haven't even seen a path to that deal. There have been no negotiations, no uh, openings for diplomacy, and we've only seen more tension. The two countries are basically coming to the brink of war, and we see a more hardline response also coming from Tehran to these hardline policies because President Trump is basically imposing the maximum pressure, as he calls it, a maximum pressure policy on Iran, a combination of sanctions and these tensions. And Tehran is conducting, as they call it, a maximum resistance policy, which means those hardliners are now the commanders, the militaristic parts of the of the country are put in charge, and they're the ones who are um, becoming increasingly powerful to run the show. We saw in the recent parliamentary elections just a few months ago in Iran that the hardliners took over the parliament by a very a uh, big majority, a parliament that what last uh, uh, last time was won uh, by heart by the moderates and reformists. So this time we saw the uh, hardliners winning that parliament, and then if this maximum pressure continues, and if President Trump stays in the office next year for Iran's presidential election, we might very well also see a hardline president coming into power after uh, Hassan Rouhani. Which I'm sure is not good for civil society inside Iran, for human rights inside Iran. Uh, but let's talk a minute about the region. Where do things stand? Uh, we hear about the gunboats of Iran that come close to US ships. Now, many of us wonder why US ships are uh, thousands of miles away to begin with. Uh, but given their, that they are there, um, is Iran uh, doing this to harass the U.S.? Is the U.S. doing this to intimidate Iran? Uh, and where uh, can this lead, given that Trump has recently uh, put out a tweet saying that he would order the shooting of these gunboats if they continue to harass U.S. ships? Well, it's a very dangerous situation. As I said, tensions are very high, and the two sides have come very close to the brink of uh, some kind of military conflict in the past year specifically, we've seen every few months something happens with the assassination of the Iranian general, with the um, attacks that happened on on um, oil ships basically in the region. We've seen both sides basically, um, I can say sometimes testing the water or the limits of the other um, but it's just a very dangerous situation and it's not going to be 100% controlled. Now, we know that none of the two sides won an actual war, an all-out war. We know President Trump doesn't want an all-out war. There's no hype for that in, uh, within the American and the Iranian society also definitely doesn't want to start a war with the U.S. Even Iranian hardliners know um, they're not going to win an all-out war against the U.S. But then at the same time, that doesn't mean that the situation can be 100% controlled. Things can get out of hand very quickly. And it seems like part of the administration is trying to push the president to the brink of that or maybe have Iran take the first step, make a mistake, and then get this war started, which will be devastating, not just for Iran and the U.S., but for the entire region. Think of the Iraq war. 10 times worse. Iran is a bigger country, a lot more populated. The central government is a lot stronger and it just has these um, forces and proxies in the region that can make, um, you know, a very uh, difficult situation basically for a lot of its neighbors if this were to happen. So it's just a very dangerous situation and um, it can get out of hand and, and become worse anytime. So the um, U.S. administration is now doing something quite remarkable, which is saying that um, we never pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. We're still in that deal, and they want to do that so they can uh, uh, do um, uh, evoke what's called the, the snapback, um, which would allow uh, sanctions to be reinstated, not just by the U.S., but by um, all of the uh, members of the Iran nuclear deal actually forced them to do that. Uh, and there's a separate but related issue about the selling of uh, conventional arms, uh, which was uh, part of the nuclear deal and is supposed to, uh, the, the uh, prohibition on those sales is supposed to be lifted in October. So Pompeo is now saying 
um, that the U.S. is actually still a part of this deal and wants to use it for both uh, the snapback and uh, extending the ban on conventional arms. Is that the case? And what do you make of this? Well, I've seen legal experts and people who've negotiated the deal, basically people who've written the JCPOA weigh in on this, calling it absurd, um, or just basically making no sense, as you're saying. It was this interesting um, comment from the secretary's top Iran person, Brian Hook, basically claiming that there's no requirement for participation, for being called a participant in the deal. It just, uh, it's, from the legal viewpoint, it seems like at least the legal experts are saying this makes no sense. And there's very, uh, not much political uh, weight that the U.S. is going to have in the Security Council, especially with the Chinese and the uh, Russians. Again, we have to wait and see. I can't um, foresee what's going to happen in the Security Council, but um, it just it seems like it's a weak legal argument and also politically the U.S. is not in a very strong position. Basically, again, going back to what President Trump was saying, he thought that by pulling out of this deal, he's going to have the Europeans on his side and then eventually uh, the rest of the Security Council, like President Obama did, he had the international support when he wanted to start the negotiations with Iran. Um, President Trump thought he's just going to you know, snap out of the deal, have the support, and then negotiate a better one. And now time is running out because we're getting close to that sunset uh, date, as you said, the uh, uh, the ban on, on selling arms to Iran. And then uh, it seems like they don't have the kind of support that they wanted, even from their closest allies in Europeans. And it's just they're put in a very complex position by the, their by their own, the administration by itself. And uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be much um, success. So can we separate out the issue of the snapback of the sanctions, which the Europeans don't want, and the extension of the ban on selling conventional weapons to Iran, which I would think the Europeans would want to continue that. Uh, is, it, is that the case? And is it the Chinese and the Russians that want that lifted because they would be the ones that would be selling those weapons? Right, so there's, first of all, there are some arms that are not included in that, um, in that ban when it comes to the especially relations between Iran and Russia. And um, as you said, the Europeans and also some Democrats, it seems like many Democrats also want that um, arms ban to continue, but not in the current situation of no diplomacy and no engagement with Iran and just a one way of basically unilateral forcing. We have to also remember that the, uh, the nuclear deal that President Trump pulled out of, that hasn't completely unraveled, meaning Iran has stayed to some extent has stayed committed to the deal, basically to the limitations that the deal has imposed on them. And if this kind of show continues in the Security Council from, from a position of force, a unilateral position, there's this danger that Iran might, um, they have threatened that they might just lift the limits on their nuclear program and there will be no um, supervision of it, basically no international monitoring of Iran's nuclear program to ensure that it stays um, peaceful and for civilian purposes only. That's also another important component of this and why um, many here in the U.S. and also the international community have been urging President Trump to not pull out of the deal or to continue negotiation and engagement with Iran, um, which hasn't happened. So let's just talk for a minute about the U.S. Um, political scene. So you have the Trump administration that really manufactured this entire crisis, some say because he wanted to undo uh, what was seen as the most significant achievement foreign policy-wise of the Obama administration. Others say it's because he's even closer to Israel and the Saudis than uh, the Obama administration was. Uh, and others say that a lot of his uh, big donors and supporters are very much uh, Iran uh, haters and have been pushing this policy. In any case, um, you had the Democrats who uh, were uh, pleased with Obama's negotiations and uh, felt that this was a much more uh, rational way to go in terms of dealing with Iran, because once you had this agreement signed, 
uh, there were expectations that then it would lead to other negotiations with Iran on other issues uh, that could help solve some of the regional conflicts. Um, but given how Trump has messed this up, um, do you feel that the Democrats have been as uh, vociferous and as strong and has done enough in Congress to try to oppose what Trump has been doing? I don't think so. It seems uh, it goes the same with the Europeans, but at the same time, it's we have to consider how much power they actually have over the president. But um, during the Democratic primary process, one uh, positive thing that happened was that almost every candidate came out publicly and declared that they're going to immediately re-enter or quickly re-enter the nuclear deal if they um, enter the White House. So that was a positive um, step and it garnered some attention and some more discussion of the deal, which was, you know, getting forgotten, the fact that President Trump pulled out of it. Um, now that discussion is over because that primary is over. But then at the same time, um, we have this, um, the Iranians are also watching the domestic scene very closely. So I don't think there's going to be much uh, interest or opening from Tehran as far as any kind of engagement with this administration, at least until November. The Iranians are watching to see um, if this president is going to stay or leave. And then if this president leaves and a Democrat comes, there will be a lot more chances for better diplomacy and engagement and um, hopefully re-entering the deal if a war hasn't started until then. But then if President Trump uh, stays, that's also a scenario that Tehran is considering and they may, we may see a change in policy and maybe some opening for engagement. But I don't think uh, much of that is going to change until November because they're also uh, watching the domestic scene um, very closely. And uh, again, when it comes to Iran, having a hardline stance on Iran and Washington has never been unpopular. So you see that even among the Democrats as well. So what is uh, Joe Biden's position on Iran? Well, Joe Biden was part of the administration that negotiated with Iran and came to that agreement, to that historic agreement. So that's part of Joe Biden's background, we have to remember. Um, but also at the beginning of this crisis, this corona crisis, he was once asked uh, by Chuck Todd if sanctions on Iran have to be lifted when it comes to this, uh, to the problem of COVID-19. And he said he doesn't have enough information on that. And then he also, there was a lot of criticism from Democrats, from his own party, and also some in the civil society and analysts that there is actually enough information and the international community is calling for lifting or easing of sanctions on Iran. And then the, a week later, he came out with a statement on specific steps that the Trump administration should take to basically ensure that Iran is going to be able to face this humanitarian crisis. So that statement was a positive step. It was a good step in the right direction, but I think there still needs to be, um, we need more um, from the Biden's foreign policy team to, for example, it's, there, it's his position on Iran hasn't been as strong as Bernie Sanders. Um, we need that kind of comparison, but um, I think there's still some, some more steps that need to be taken. And what about his position in terms of saying that uh, Trump does not have authorization for military action against Iran? Well, we saw that there's a bipartisan support, basically, vote in Congress on uh, preventing the president from or giving him authorization to start a war um, with Iran that the president has vowed to veto that. So we have to see how that becomes uh, the legal part of that uh, plays out. But it seems like there's no, as, again, as I said, there's no appetite for war, even among Republicans, Trump's own party. Uh, definitely not in the American public, in Congress, and also not Democrats. But when we talk about war, it's the beginning or the starting the war. So there's no, there's definitely no appetite for a full-on invasion, Iraq style. But it seems like the the ones who do want a war with Iran are looking for unconventional ways of getting it started without the type of invasion that happened with Iraq. And that's the danger, the military conflict that could um, get out of hand and lead to a more dangerous situation in the region. 
Well, and we at Code Pink think that the economic sanctions are a form of warfare uh, and a form of collective punishment against uh, over 80 million Iranian people. So for people who are suffering inside Iran, uh, there is a, a war going on. Uh, but I want to thank you for your Stephane. time. I hope our listeners will stay with us for a minute because uh, when you say goodbye, I just want to say some of the things that Code Pink is doing and how people can help us. Uh, are there any closing words you want to uh, give us before you leave us, Nigar? Just to add to the great point you made, sanctions have been basically the main part of the Iranian society. The, the, the middle class and the working class are the ones who are bearing the brunt of sanctions, are paying the highest price for this economic blockade in a way, the way the Iranians are seeing it. And um, it's it hasn't changed much of Iran's regional activities. It hasn't weakened the hardline factions of Iran. It's only um, strengthened them. It's only weakened the parts of the society and the political system that wants more better relations with the West, even with the US, better engagement. So it's definitely not um, going, moving towards the intended goals that we hear from the administration. And it's definitely hurting the Iranian people, which is something that the administration denies. But thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. And um, it's good to be here with you and everyone else. Great. Well, thank you for your brilliant writing and analysis and for taking the time to be with us. Thank you. So for our listeners, if you can just hang on for a moment, uh, Nagar, you can press the leave meeting if you want. Uh, and I know you have other things to do. I just wanted to let our listeners know um, what Code Pink is doing. And uh, we have a very vibrant campaign around Iran. You can go to the website, codepink.org backslash Iran. It includes educational activities, uh, such as these webinars that we're doing regularly. Uh, we're bringing the voices of Iranians, both from Iran and Iranian Americans, many of them women, uh, for you to hear firsthand. Uh, we have uh, also a a campaign to be lobbying Congress for two things. One, against any kind of military intervention in Iran, which is basically reiterating what the Constitution says, uh, that the president does not have the authority without congressional approval uh, to uh, go to war with Iran. And the other is about the sanctions. There is, as Negar said, a growing chorus from uh, all sides, the United Nations, the European Union, uh, presidents of other countries, uh, legal societies here in the United States, humanitarian groups, uh, all kinds of people uh, pushing for a relief of the sanctions. Uh, many of us saying they should be lifted entirely and others saying at least during this pandemic, they should be lifted. Uh, in any case, we think that growing chorus is starting to have an impact on uh, the administration because they are uh, doing more to justify saying that they are not trying to stop medical aid and food from getting to Iran, uh, but indeed they are. So we need your help to be pressuring the White House, uh, what's called OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control within the Treasury Department where we have been contacting them directly. And you can see a link on our website to a petition that goes directly to uh, that uh, Office of Foreign Assets Control, uh, telling them to, that we need to lift these sanctions. Um, we also have a campaign that is uh, focusing on humanitarian aid to Iran, while our government is doing everything it can to deny the Iranian people uh, the basics that they need in this time of crisis. Uh, we have been supporting a group called Moms Against Poverty. I know the Giving Tuesday is coming up, so uh, we hope you will think of uh, this group and you can donate to them on our website, codepink.org, on the Iran page. And um, so I, uh, oh, one final thing is we are supporting individuals like an Iranian who got caught in the United States when he came to visit his daughters 
uh, Dr. Agsari. He is being held in ICE detention center under miserable conditions, and he has contacted uh, COVID-19, and he is very sick. Uh, he only wants to go back to Iran, and we have a petition you can sign to say, um, allow him to return to his home country of Iran. So these are some of the things that we're working on. We appreciate your support. Uh, so please go to our website and see the different ways that you can work with us. And if you have your own ideas you would like to suggest to us, you can write to us at info at codepink.org. So thank you very much for joining us today. Stay safe during this time of a uh, tremendous uh, grief and crisis. Uh, and we hope that by working together, we can change the way the US relates to countries like Iran, as well, of course, as changing the way our government relates to us, the American people. Today is a day, uh, May 1st, uh, called um, People's Bailout. Uh, and we hope you are supporting all of those activities as well to stop the bailout of corporations and instead bail out the people. So thank you so much for joining us. Be safe.